Hello, my name is Leslie Sullivan Sachs. I live in Brattleboro, Vermont, and I'm a member of the Safe and Green Campaign and the Sage Alliance. On September 5th, 2012, we organized a flotilla on the Connecticut River in front of the Vermont Yankee nuclear reactor. Why did we do that? Well, because Vermont Yankee is heating up our river. Our river is one of our most precious resources, and they're using it as a dump for their thermal pollution. 50 to 65 percent of energy produced by nuclear power plants is waste heat. If that waste heat is not converted into electricity, something has to be done with it. Every day, Vermont Yankee pumps 500 million gallons of heated water back into the Connecticut River. The thermal plume stretches 55 miles downstream from Vernon, Vermont to Holyoke, Massachusetts. Thermal pollution is this waste heat put back into the river. Sometimes the water is as high as 105 degrees. In 2012, that summer, we had record droughts <coughs> and heat waves. Vermont Yankee had to limit the output of the, that heated water four times in July alone because of how low the river was flowing from the drought, and how high the heat of the water already was. At one point, they reduced production to 83% of its capacity. There's no reason for energy to continue to put this thermal pollution into our river. A solution already exists. A closed loop system using cooling towers enables reactors to avoid thermal pollution. Yankee uses the cooling towers when the water in the river is too low or when the temperature of the river is too high, like what was happening in July. But Entergy says that it's too expensive to use the cooling towers all the time. There's no reason for Entergy to pollute the river with this thermal pollution. A solution already exists. A closed loop system using the cooling towers enables reactors to avoid thermal pollution. Yankee uses its cooling towers when the river is too low or when the water temperature is too high, like what happened this July. But Entergy says it's too expensive to use the cooling towers all the time. We want Entergy to use those cooling towers all the time. They say that it would cost too much to protect our river. We cannot sit silently while Entergy puts its profits over the health of our river. And that's why we organized this flotilla.
watch all the fun over there. I got all the beer. Boy, we are going to be close. In February of 2012, Hydroanalysis completed a review of Vermont Yankees thermal discharge modeling. Vermont Yankee hired Applied Science Associates to complete a report which was used by Vermont Yankee in their application to the Environmental Protection Agency when they were looking for a renewed Clean Water Act permit. Hydroanalysis analyzed that report. Their findings were very disturbing. Finding one included the downstream areas below the Vernon Pool were excluded from the model and not characterized at all. When we all know that the thermal um, discharge sometimes reaches all the way down to Holyoke, Massachusetts. Finding two, Applied Science Associates did not provide sufficient field data and model resort results to support assessment of potential impacts on aquatic species. So they didn't look closely enough at how it would impact the entire ecology of the river, including the fish. In their summary, they say, this report has not provided sufficient information to support a finding that in the language of the Clean Water Act, the, quote, protection and propagation of a balanced indigenous population of shellfish, fish, and wildlife in and on the body of water is assured. Their demonstrations failed to characterize the nature and extent of the thermal plumes associated with Vermont Yankee discharge. Long-term predictions of temperature conditions in the study were not presented in any of the demonstration reports as specified by the EPA. Dynamic temperature conditions throughout the study area have not been evaluated it goes on to say, it is not possible to map the thermal plume or assess whether or not the fish exclusion area is too large or whether or not fish migration is blocked. From their report, it is not possible to assess the potential for fish to suffer appreciable harm from cold shock or excess heat. And they conclude Methods and modeling tools are readily available for conducting appropriate thermal characterization studies to support determination of whether or not the thermal discharge is harmful to the Connecticut River fishery. Unfortunately, the applicant has elected to employ inappropriate methods and misuse a potentially suitable model.
In other words, Vermont Yankee is not going far enough or deep enough, and it is twisting what facts are in front of it. We in the Sage Alliance knew that Vermont Yankee was having a negative impact on the Connecticut River, on the fish, and on the ecology of the river. Um, decades of evidence and studies have shown us this. We were especially upset, however, with the fact that it was taking so long to get any action from the state of Vermont or from the Environmental Protection Agency um, for their Entergy's Clean Water Act permit for the plant. Um, they are operating under what is called a zombie permit. Their permit expired years ago. I believe it's seven years ago. Um, and under the federal rules, um, as long as you apply before your permit expires, then the old permit is still in place and you can keep operating. Well, I, I don't know if when they created that rule, they really imagined it to be able to be used for so many years. Um, and they Scientific study and models um, have improved since uh, these rules were created. The other thing that we are concerned about is global warming. Climate change is really having an impact on our rivers. Um, nuclear power plants use vast quantities of water. Um, Hydropower plants, dams, are the biggest users of water to create electricity, obviously. Nuclear power plants are the second largest users of water to create energy. What they do is they draw the water from either the river or the bay, if they're on the ocean, and they use it to cool down the reactors, uh, the fuel rods, to keep them from being too hot. And then they put that water um, back into the river. And they, have, they are permitted to um, put that water back into the river within a certain temperature range. They're not supposed to heat up the water um, any more than the laws allow. With climate change, um, the levels of our rivers is going down. There's less and less water. That's been one of the impacts of climate change. We especially were seeing that last year and the year before. Record high temperatures and low 
Um, and you can read about this throughout the United States. There's parts of the Mississippi River that are completely dried up. Shocking. We knew this was also happening in the Connecticut River. Uh, so because um, they draw the less water out of the river and put it back, um, it's just heating up our river. Um, studies have shown that uh, the cold water fish that used to live in our rivers, um, for example, the shad, are no longer there because over time, Vermont Yankee has heated up the temperature of the water to such an extent that the cold river fish don't want to live there anymore, so now instead we're getting the warm water fish. So there's many, many impacts that um, heating up our river um, is having. Um, and the other really frustrating thing is that it's not necessary. If Energy Corporation, which has the money, would spend it to um, build or rehabilitate um, cooling towers that would be used to circulate the water. They would not need to be pulling the water out of our river and putting it back in. During these really high temperature times, that's what they do. They use their cooling towers. It costs them a lot of money. And it would cost them a lot of money to fix their cooling towers at Vermont Yankee to the extent that they would be used all the time. Um, in New York State, uh, for Indian Point nuclear reactor, which is also owned by Entergy, um, the state has said that Indian Point reactor um, has to build cooling towers and only use cooling towers and that they will no longer be allowed to use the water from the Hudson River or to put the water back into the Hudson River anymore. And that's essentially what we would like to see happen uh, on the Connecticut River by the state of Vermont. We would like cooling towers um, to be used instead of our river water 24-7. So we were trying to think, how do we educate the public on this somewhat complicated issue? And um, someone had the brilliant idea, or a group of us, of having this flotilla. Um, we have actually talked about it for a couple of years. And so beginning in uh, January or February of 2012, we started organizing this event. And our vision was to get as many people to come out on the river as possible in front of uh, Vermont Yankee in their canoes and um, their um, little motor boats and um, diff their kayaks um, and that we would, for those land lovers like myself, um, we would also have a number of people who would stand um, on the shore. And that this visualization in front of Vermont Yankee um, would attract enough attention that we would be able to explain the situation to the public and that it would really um, grab their attention. We had speakers. Um, one was uh, Mr. Chris Parenti, who is a writer for The Nation magazine. Um, and we also had uh, David Dean, who is the river keeper. Um, he works for the Connecticut River Watershed Council. He is also um, representative to the uh, Vermont legislature from Wyndham County. Um, we had people singing, we had banners, um, we had a symbolic ice drop where we brought ice cubes and um, put them into the river to cool it down. Um, and our vision was fulfilled. Um, it was a fabulous event that hundreds participated in. Um, unfortunately, we had planned it for one weekend and um, there was a terrific storm, um, very cold, high winds, and rain, so we had to uh, um, postpone it for a week to the following weekend. And it was very gratifying to see um, that people followed right along and, and showed up. We're talking about doing this every year 
until either Vermont Yankee shuts down or this problem of thermal pollution is taken care of once and for all by cooling towers being erected. ramp is over there. You see that? That wall? It's on the other side of that wall and there's just a little stone arch bridge that they go under. You, you would never get this in there, all right? But they go under that stone arch bridge and they come out with a little channel that comes out. Catch somebody doing an ice cream. For most of the year, the effect of thermal pollution on the river, the heating up of the river, is invisible. We can't see it. But in the winter time, it's very clear. In the winter time, north of Vermont Yankee, there's plenty of ice on the river going across both sides from shore to shore. It comes right down to the Hinsdale boat ramp. It comes right down to just above Vermont Yankee's discharge valve. And from then on, all the way down to Northampton, Massachusetts, the river is clear of ice. South, down by the Oxbow, for example, the ice starts up again. So next time you want to go ice fishing or skating, take a little drive. See where the ice stops. That's the effect of thermal pollution on the river. On March 22nd, we marched from the Common here in Brattleboro for three miles up Putney Road to the headquarters on Old Ferry Road. When we were there, 147 people were arrested for trespassing on energy property. Then just a few weeks later, in mid-April, we held another rally on the Brattleboro Common. Highlights of that rally included a wonderful speech by our Senator Bernie Sanders. And we also heard from Peter Shumlin, our governor, who talked about the 10 broken promises that Entergy has made 
since receiving its original state permit. We also heard from our Attorney General who talked about being taken to court by Entergy. We had another thousand people there. In May, we started planning two events. One occurred on July 1st at the gates of Vermont Yankee, and the theme of that was our energy independence. And we also worked on this flotilla. We worked on this flotilla for three months because it was a huge undertaking. It involved a committee of 12 to 15 people, some of whom live in Montpelier, some of whom live in Massachusetts. We started meeting every two weeks and then towards the end every week. We had many different challenges along the way. Um, the last challenge that we confronted was the fact that this action was actually planned to happen on September 7th, but a massive wind and rainstorm was predicted and it did come through. Um, I went to the river that day and there were white caps on the river. So we had to postpone the entire action a week. Even so, we had over 250 people come. We had 150 on the water and we had 100 on the shore. It was beautiful. We had to figure out how do you do a sound system um, so that people on both the shore and the water can hear it. And we figured that out. We wanted to have nice, stable, steady boats for press. So some folks all the way up in Fairleigh, Vermont rented us two pontoons. We had to figure out how to get the pontoons all the way down to uh, Vermont Yankee Shores. We needed to get permits from the Marine Patrol on the New Hampshire side of the river. We of course talked to the state police on the Vermont side of the river and the state police on the New Hampshire side of the river. Um, and the Marine Patrol in um, New Hampshire were very accommodating and they really helped us out a lot. Um, Captain Tim Dunleavy of the Marine Patrol um, said that um, he didn't anticipate any issues and in fact none came along. We were of course most concerned with safety. That's not just... Uh, <laughs> safety is something that We've been told over and over again by Entergy that we're not allowed to talk about because it's the purview of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. But safety is something that we care about a lot. We care about it every time we put on a demonstration. And we certainly care about the safety of the human beings who live around Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Plant. So I'm going to talk about safety. We get permits every time we put on an action because we care about safety. We have medics who are in every single action. This time our medics drove down from Burlington, Vermont because they were so excited. They came to us and said, please, can we take part in this action? We had um, medics on three different boats out in the river. One was a bow rider that's, uh, I hadn't even heard of a bow rider before but it actually has a, uh, it's a motor boat. They can get there really fast. And then we had uh, medics that, one on a pontoon and one on a canoe. Um, we have medics at every single action that we do. We have peacekeepers who are specially trained folks who come to every action to make sure that everything runs smoothly, to help people figure out where to go, and to um, negotiate with uh, any challenges that might arise right there on the spot. We had all these folks at our actions in March and in April and in July and they really came through for us during the flotilla even on the water. Um, we also had to figure out um, how we were going to get um, all the people actually onto the river. There isn't really one spot where a you know, 75 to 100 canoes and kayaks and motorboats can put into the river. Um, 
we spent a couple of weeks walking up and down the river and looking at all the different places um, and came up with a game plan um, that worked really well. It's just beautiful little cove um, and we had Captain Andy there um, passing out flyers to each person with their boats um, to uh, which were a list of our safety guidelines for the day. And he made sure that everybody who was getting into a boat had on a life jacket. Um, and he helped them um, get into the river smoothly, park their cars smoothly. So it was a very complicated action with many, many pieces of part and parts. And I also really want to thank the media because when we had to postpone this action for a week, and asked the media to come back on a Saturday. Um, we were just felt so excited um, that they saw how unique and important this action was and, and that they actually did come along with us, um, including BCTV. Um, and that uh, it made, it really helped get the word out. Um, if you go on the savinggreencampaign.org website, and you look on the action page and you can look at lots of pictures and newspaper articles from the flotilla and see that it really did help uh, spread the word far and wide um, about the issue of thermal pollution by this creative, a little bit crazy, people said, action that we did. The opening uh, speech was given by Deb Katz. Deb is one of the founders and the director of the Citizens Awareness Network um, that has members in Massachusetts, Vermont, and New Hampshire. And Deb was uh, one of the reasons why Row Yankee um, actually shut down successfully. And Deb inspired us all to take further action after leaving the river that day. Um, this action took a very long time to plan, many, many months, and many, many people who live, most of whom who live within the evacuation zone of Vermont Yankee, within 20 miles. So I just really want to acknowledge some of the folks who worked really hard on this action. Bob Beatty of Brattleboro, Vermont. He's our logistics wizard. Deb Katz from the Citizens Awareness Network. Robin Conley, who lives just five miles from Vermont Yankee in Northfield, Massachusetts. Leo Schiff from Brattleboro. Tom Wyatt from Warwick, Massachusetts. Packy Wyland from Northampton, Massachusetts. Bob McCormick. Andy Larkin from the Pioneer Valley. Court Dorsey. Wendell, Massachusetts, and Kim Medeiros from Amherst, Mass. I'd like to thank our musicians that day, Annie Hassert, Molly Scott, and One Journey. You'll hear their music. It's just beautiful. And then, of course, we had speakers. We were so honored when Christian Parenti said yes to our invitation. Christian Parenti is a writer and editor for the monthly publication the nation. He's a beautiful writer who's followed these issues for many years. He's grown up in Vermont and has been spending the past year here um, as a visiting professor at one of our local um, schools. I believe it's uh, SIT. And he um, wrote a book recently called Tropic of Chaos about global warming. And you'll hear in our video how he talks about how new, uh, nuclear energy is not the solution to global warming.
from cradle to grave, nuclear power is a dirty business. We were also honored to have speak before us David Dean. He's a representative from Wyndham County. He's also the river steward for the Connecticut River Watershed Council. And he talked about some of the permitting issues that are uh, before the Agency of Natural Resources right now. They, uh, it, a funny story, um, Christian Parenti, uh, it was getting close to the time for him to speak um, before the microphone on the shore. And we were looking around going, where's Christian? Where's Christian? We don't see him anywhere. And then this canoe pulls up onto one of the rocks and he gave out a big wave and said, here I am! And he climbed up out of the water to give his speech because he felt so strongly about this issue. He really wanted to be part of the flotilla, not just a, uh, a bystander, an audience member watching from the shore. As a close to this very special action, we performed a symbolic ice drop. People brought ice cubes in coolers with them on their boats, and they dropped them into the river, just as a symbolism of our desire to cool down the river, to bring it back, to the temperature that it was before Vermont Yankee started putting its waste into the river 30 years ago. Some people found this very moving, described it as performance art. It was an appropriate way to close out a long and beautiful day.
of their hot tub. Yeah. Yeah, that's the outlet from the hot tub. Yay. The hot tub outlet. Now that place is built just like the Springfield Jail. Imagine that. It is. Double fence, razor wire, the whole nine yards. The inner fence, I welded every stink and stay in that fence. <laughs> really? Yeah. Long, long time ago. Oh. Dragon speed. Yeah, they got an armored car sitting there ready to go. Good enough for you, fellas? is going to be over there. He seems better. I don't think that's a Brinks truck.
I don't. He does apparently. I guarantee his motor flow. Guarantee.
Stone as well. And we are here along our beautiful river. And we're going to sing a song about how we need Your to anchor's change drifting. this world around. So it's got an easy chorus, and we hope you join in on it. Well, thank you. We're going to change this world around. We're going to change this world around. Where there is darkness, we're going to shine light. We're going to change this. Change this world, we're gonna change this world around. We're gonna get higher every day. We'll be walking every day. Where there is darkness, we're gonna shine light. We're gonna change this, change this world. We're gonna change this world around. Waffle the clown is there, by the way.
glad now I can feel my things turning. I'm so glad now I can make it through. We can make it through. All right. Our next speaker, Christian Corinthian. Showing bottom right there. Thanks for coming out today uh, on the river. Uh, so I'm actually, I live in Brooklyn, New York, and I teach at SIT, but I'm from Putney, Vermont, originally. And so I actually began protesting this plant before I could go. So uh, on one hand, it's very sad that here it is still operating after its license is expired. On the other hand, it's really great to see all of you out here. So, you know, in the, uh, in the ensuing 20 years since I first, 20 plus years since I first started protesting this plan, uh, along with people like Leo, who finally invited me to this, the issue of climate change has really come to the fore. And I think it has forced us to think about atomic power in new ways. First of all, there are a lot of Greens who are so frightened by climate change, as they should be, that they have embraced the idea of widespread use of atomic power. James Lovelock, the father of the Gaia principle, is one of these. George Mario, the uh, great environmental writer out of England, is another. But there is a, a number of major problems with that position. One of them being that the science of climate change is such that it's clear we do not have time to build out
Everyone signed the Kyoto Protocol. This is an international agreement to cut greenhouse gases. The Senate refused to ratify this treaty. So at that point, a bunch of states and environmental groups sued the EPA and said, look, you have the obligation to regulate greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean Air Act. It took 10 years. That case was finally resolved in 2007. The Supreme Court under George Bush said, yes, the states and the activists are correct. The Environmental Protection Agency has an obligation to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Since 2007, we have been waiting for about 30 different rules to come out of the EPA. If they were to embrace their obligations and issue robust rules, they would essentially impose a de facto carbon tax on dirty forms of fuel, which would then drive all sorts of investment immediately into building out clean forms of energy like wind power, solar power, be it concentrated and on a commercial scale or decentralized and uh, feeding into to the grid from residential areas. We're still waiting for most of those rules because the Obama administration has instructed the EPA to go slow on that for fear of offending the Republicans. So we have so we have the laws, we have the technology. It's yep. not like we haven't invented uh, effective wind power, uh, you know, hydropower, solar power, big hydro is a problem, but you know what I'm saying. We have the technology. Also, is there the money? Yes, there's the money to deal with this without turning to atomic power. The money to help build out a real clean energy infrastructure comes from one, potentially the military budget, which is absolutely distorted. I don't need to tell all of you about that. So that could be cut, redirected. But even, let, let's not even think about the military budget for a second. The federal government is the single largest consumer of power in the U.S. economy. The federal government alone has a fleet of 450,000 mostly huge office buildings that all buy electricity. If all of those buildings committed themselves to buying clean power and set up a schedule with utilities to help bring that online, if they were all retrofitted to use less power and possibly even become sources of power generation, that would help jumpstart a general market for clean power. This is a point that I think is we need to, to talk about and think about, especially in the face of extreme weather and, and the kind of disasters like Irene that, that climate change is bringing. Government is not the problem. It's not the, 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 the bogeyman that the right points it out. So a lot of people on the left don't embrace the potential uses of government. So we don't talk about stuff like the fact that about one-third of the U.S. economy is already government activity. If you add together the states and the federal governments, they consume enormous amounts of power. So if states, state governments and federal governments committed themselves to buying electric vehicles, purchasing clean power, shutting down nuke plants, we, are, we would be, you know, halfway there. There's tons, there's also tons and tons of money in the corporate sector that is not being invested. I'm not talking about money paid out as bonuses to CEOs or money paid to shareholders. Money held by firms that they intend to invest but are sitting on is now at about $2 trillion. Corporate America, according to the Federal Reserve, has never held more uninvested money at any time since 1956. So there's money to be invested immediately in the alternatives. In other words, we do not need atomic power. Um, the final thing I would say in terms of climate change and atomic power is this, that these are plants, these rickety old plants are very dangerous in, in terms of how we are to adapt to climate change. If we know that there are going to be more extreme floods, more extreme droughts, we have to build into our society resilience. This plant and plants like it are the weakest links in the chain, and that's a new reason why they must be shut down. And finally, the final thing I would say is just you know, just remember, whenever people are talking about the future of atomic power, it's a myth. They're not building these plants. China's building a handful of them, but they're not building these plants. So what, you're, what we're really talking about is whether or not we're going to relicense or close down old existing plants, because there isn't going to be a new fleet. All there is is this old zombie fleet, and anyone who thinks that the issue of atomic power is about the future is missing the point. It's about these relics from the past and how they threaten our ability to build a more resilient society so that we can adapt to climate change. So keep up the good work. You're very inspiring. I'm glad to be part of this flotilla.
once again, Molly Scott. Where is Charlemagne? Charlemagne. to say that I came to political awareness of this dragon in the cage from living next to the Roe nuclear power plant, as did dead cats, and there that one closed down. And like a mist upon the mountains, people we are rising, and there's no hope stronger than breeze upon the river and the hope in the hearts of those who are wounded we will keep on rising until we are free there is hope in the morning memory of the twilight there is hope in the rolling song of dawn there are those that who are not free. So we will dance twice as long, twice as hard, twice as deep, until we all dance and sail free. And like a mist upon the river, people, we are rising, and there's no hope stronger than the breeze upon the stream. Time to rewrite all the old songs again. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. You know God's gonna occupy the water. Why don't you wait in the water? Well, they won't be silenced and they will not 
Watershed Council, the funders who have underwrote, written some of the activities I'm about to talk about, and uh, the uh, Environmental and Natural Resources Law Center at Vermont Law School. Their ongoing support has allowed us to bring this issue to where we are right now. And I'm, I'm telling you, th there's no guarantee at this point in time that in fact that plant will be stopped from putting hot water into the Connecticut River. We are challenging that and recently through the support we've gotten from various funders we have done three in-depth scientific evaluations of the information that Yankee has presented to the state of Vermont to justify their discharge. What do we find? Vermont has consistently cherry-picked their scientific information. Their evaluation of the plume that comes out of that plant only goes to the dam. They've completely ignored that it could and does have an effect downstream of the dam. The model they use that has convinced the state of Vermont that it's okay to discharge this hot water is not approved by EPA and they have refused to release it for a third party independent review. The fish species that are part of this justification they use, they have to pick certain species of fish in order to be able to show that there's no damage. Guess what? They picked hot water fish. And then finally, in the last report we just issued last week, we took a look at the underlying science in that permit and it's based on an equation, a formula, to predict what the temperature increase should be at any given time uh, coming out of the plant. Except the formula doesn't give you the same answer as you get when you stick a thermometer in the river and track the actual temperature. So this, the existing discharge permit, someone used the word zombie, it's a zombie. The discharge permit expired in 2006, they've been going year to year ever since. But the original permit was issued in 2001. Nothing about their discharge has been rigorously, scientifically evaluated since 2001. And our knowledge base has significantly expanded since then. As some of you who read the local paper know, we tried to talk with them. We wanted to present them with a copy of the report. We also wanted to present them with a plate of cookies. We just wanted to be neighborly. And uh, guess what? They stonewalled us. They refused to listen to almost 600 of their neighbors who have signed on to our petition through postcards asking Entergy to cool it and we can't even present them the postcards because they won't answer the doorbell. I did, it's been mentioned, but I, I, I want to say it again. This is your river. 
It is your water under the public trust doctrine. They are your fish under the Vermont Constitution. And today sends a great message. But it's a symbolic message. And as I said when I started up here, there's no guarantee that their thermal discharge will be controlled any better by the state in the new discharge permit than it is right now. So I want to ask you to do more. I want you to contact the Agency of Natural Resources. Look them up in the phone book, but 802-241-3600. Tell the secretary to issue the new permit. Get in touch with the governor, 802-828-3333. Tell him to issue the new permit and that the terms of that new permit should be what is called closed cycle so that they have to use those cooling towers all the time. No hot water into the Connecticut River.
Love it is unstoppable, so spread it hand to hand. Surely, 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 there is a higher plan. Love it is unstoppable, so spread it hand to hand. Surely, 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 we gather with one voice. The people care about the earth, and nukes are not the choice. Surely, 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 we gather with one voice. The people care about the earth, the nukes are not a choice. Surely, 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 let's learn from our mistake. We watch the meltdowns hurt the earth, and what else does it take? Surely, 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 let's learn from our mistake. We watch the meltdowns hurt the earth. Just does it take? Surely, 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 we'll sing them out of town. We'll make our car from wind and sun, so shut all Yankee down. Surely, 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 we'll sing them out of town. We'll watch our car from wind and sun, so shut all Yankee down. Surely, 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 we'll sing them out of town. Watch the power from wind and sun, so shut all Yankee down. Surely, 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 we'll sing them out of town. We'll make our power from wind and sun, so shut all Yankee down. So shut all Yankee down. So shut all Yankee down. So I'd like to sing you out with this one. It's a song by Holly Near. And uh, you know, there's so many good songs by her, but I'm going to do this one today. It's called I Ain't Afraid. I ain't afraid. I ain't afraid. I ain't afraid. I'm afraid of what you do in the name of your God. I ain't afraid of your Yahweh. I ain't afraid of your Allah. I ain't afraid of your Jesus. I'm afraid of what you do in the name of your God. I ain't afraid of your churches. I ain't afraid of your temples. I ain't afraid. Of your brain, I'm afraid of what you do in the name of your God. Rise up to a higher power, free up from fear, it will devour you. Watch out for the ego of the hour. The ones that say they know it are the ones who will determine on you. I ain't afraid of your Yahweh, I ain't afraid. Of your Allah, I ain't afraid. Of your Jesus, I'm afraid of what you do in the name of your God. I ain't afraid. Of your churches, I ain't afraid. Of your temples, I ain't afraid. Of your praying, I'm afraid of what you do in the name of your God. Rise up. To a higher story, free up from the God of purgatory. Watch out for the threats of purgatory. The spirit of the wind will make a killing of our sinner. I say, I ain't afraid of your Bible. I ain't afraid of your Torah. I ain't afraid. Of your Quran, don't let the letter of the law start killing us, it's killing us. I say I ain't afraid of your Yahweh, I ain't afraid of your Allah, I ain't afraid of your Jesus, I'm afraid of what you do in the name of your God, I ain't afraid of your money, I ain't afraid of your culture, I ain't afraid 
of your choices. I'm afraid of what you do in the name of your God. I ain't afraid of your Sunday. I ain't afraid of your spirit. I ain't afraid of your teachers. I'm afraid of what you do in the name of your God. I ain't afraid of your Sabbath. I ain't afraid of your borders. I ain't afraid of your dances. I'm afraid of what you do in the name of your God. I ain't afraid of your children. I ain't afraid of your music. I ain't afraid of your story. I'm afraid of what you do in the name of your God. I ain't afraid.
to hold our faith. Although we feel the turmoil, the truth is always safe. Surely, 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 we need to hold our faith. Though we feel the turmoil, the truth is always safe. Surely, 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 the waves will come and go. One day stars will be the shore, the next is calm and slow. Surely, 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 we keep holding on. We will see a better day. These times will be gone. Surely, 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 we keep holding on. We will see a better day. These times will be gone. Surely, surely, we'll sing them out of town. We'll make our car from wind and sun, so shut all Yankee down. Surely, surely, surely. Surely, surely, we'll sing them out of town. We'll make our car from wind and sun, so shut all Yankee down. 